I said, I'll be there, I'll do it. But I know that I won't. It's just so much less awkward when I don't rock the boat. Like all of these voices I hear on the screen, don't check if it's real to affect what I think. When did truth become like a figure of speech? Is delusion preferred to honesty? You're doing fine. There's no need to change. Everyone's perfect in their own special way. I know that it sounds good, and sometimes it's true, but more often than not, I just pander to you. Yes, grace is important. Yes, I should be kind, but I can't help but feel that there's no love in lies. God invites us to be world changers. And I believe that world-changing power happens more in small bite-sized bits as we walk through our normal days than the massive epic things that are important but we don't experience on a daily basis. We can be world changers when we make a decision that, that we are going to, to say, I'll make one decision and take one action that impacts one person. I will make that choice again and again and again. And today we're talking about the decision, the choice to be relentlessly truthful in a white lie culture, that we would be relent, we would commit ourselves to be people who will speak the truth even when it's difficult, even when it's challenging, even when it's scary. And the reality is that we live in a world where little white lies, and you know, there's, there's nothing, there's a technical word for little white lies. You know what it is? Lies. Thank you, exactly. <laughs> it's lies. Uh, we just, we just kind of kind of put a little bit of icing on the cake and make it a little tastier, but a lie is a lie, right? And God calls us to be truth tellers. And, and we see this sort of false or shading the truth or, or kind of deceptive uh, advertising or things that you go, you, you read things, you see things, and you go, I don't think that's totally true. You ever had that experience? You ever seen an ad? And you've looked and you've gone, there's more going on than meets the eye. I'll give you a couple older ads here. I asked our team to find these. And I, I, I picked the ones that, I, that were my favorites in terms of just being very sneaky. So just look at the first one here and see what might be not totally honest here. Here's some deceptive advertising. <laughs> More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. The message is, be healthy, be like a doctor, start smoking, right? Well, okay, here's another one. This is an old one. Uh, this is kind of nice. Stay fit and slim by taking amphetamine. <laughs> Most doctors aren't recommending that these days, but she looks happy. Um, <laughs> here's a third one. And notice, notice the hands holding the item here. Okay, here we go. Let this magic mineral asbestos protect your buildings on your farm. It's, it's so healthy you can hold it in your hands. Right? Well, we've learned something since then. Here's my favorite one. I just thought this was beautiful. Just, I won't even say it. We'll just look at it. <laughs> Let's just, just raise your hand if the greatest joy in your life is eating lard. Uh, and, and then here's a, little, here's a little commercial, just a little ad. And try to pick up the subtle untruth in this ad. Go ahead and watch the screens. It's called Lipazine, clinically proven to reduce your body fat and weight. In a major university double-blind study, not only did participants lose weight, but 78% of the weight lost was pure body fat. What's even more amazing is that people were not asked to change their daily lives. It's so easy. Just take Lipazine twice a day. That's it. And people weren't even asked to change their lives. <laughs> just, you know, just take this and the... the do you just be slender and slim as can be? I, I don't think, when a doctor's sitting over here in the first service, and I said, is there any routine where you don't change your eating, your exercise, that's going to make a difference? He just went, mm-mm. doesn't work that way, right? But, but we get, it's in the air we breathe. This idea, that this sort of taking things and twisting them a little bit, shading them, coloring them, presenting them differently, and, and, and there's a word for little white lies. It's lies. And God calls us to be truth tellers. We're called to be truth tellers. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to walk through this chapter and look at a big, quite, quite a big portion of it and get a sense of what God is saying through Paul to Timothy. But we have to remember that this letter is actually, this letter is found in the Bible, and we have chapters and verses, but originally it was a letter inspired by the Spirit of God through the Apostle Paul, who was in jail, who was drawing near the end of his life. He, it's probably the last letter that he wrote. And he's writing to Timothy, this young pastor in the city of Ephesus, and he's trying to give him a kind of a model for ministry and a direction. He's saying, Timothy, speak the truth, even when it's tough. 
And we need to hear this message today. And so again, just a snapshot of Paul and Timothy. When you meet Paul, you discover that he's a teacher and truth teller. And the power of helping others grow in truth. What the apostle Paul is really saying to Timothy is he's saying, Timothy, I'm receiving God's truth. I'm bringing God's truth from the Old Testament and inspired by the Holy Spirit. I'm passing it on to you. So Paul is a truth teller, a teacher of truth. And then Timothy is a passionate disciple. He's receiving. He's a disciple of others, and he's receiving from Paul. So he discovers the power of helping others grow in the truth as well. The apostle Paul is passing on truth to Timothy. Timothy's receiving that truth and being challenged to pass it on to the next generation. And we're going to get a picture of that this morning that I hope will, will make sense to you and will paint a picture in your mind of the importance of you and me being truth tellers. Because here's the reality. We're all teachers. You may not have the spiritual gift of teaching. You may not have a class you teach. But you're teaching someone something all the time. People are watching us. I learned this as now as an adult looking back at my upbringing. There are things that my dad and mom taught me that they didn't mean to teach me, that they weren't saying, I'm going to teach you something now, Kevin. They just taught because of the way they lived. So for instance, my parents had a routine where once a month we would have a little family meeting. We'd sit around the dining room table and we'd talk about the family goals, what we were doing, what's coming up for our family. That's why Shoreline now has a family moment every month because I learned that from my parents. Just share what's going on. Keep everybody up to speed with what's happening. You know, let the family kind of, kind of walk together through that. But my parents would do this, and, and then my parents, when they gave us directions for our lives, they always put it in writing. So we all, all of us kids had chores. That's right, we were abused as children. We were, to, we, we were asked to do chores, and we weren't even paid for it. Um, oh, maybe locked up today. But, 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 so, but on the refrigerator was this big orange chart, and it had three columns of chores. And one week it would be outdoor chores, like lawn, uh, yard work. Then the next week it would be indoor cleaning, and the next week it would be cooking, and that kind of stuff. And, and we had magnets with our names, you know, Kevin, Allison, Gretchen, and then the other two came along 10 years later. So I just remember that when we were kids. And, and then we would just, the magnet would go above our column, and we'd have to do all those chores every day. And if we didn't, there were consequences. That's right, there were consequences. And um, not a sermon on parenting, but it's good that there were, because otherwise I wouldn't have done it. And so, and then when my dad would give us directions to certain things, he'd make like a bullet point list of what he expected of us. And then at the bottom would be the consequences if we didn't follow through. That's how I was raised. Now, people on staff are going, oh, that explains a lot. <laughs> Because, because Kevin's always about clarity and lists and expectations. But that's, that's how I was raised. And, and then one day, one of my boys came to me. And he said, Dad, I thought, I thought our family was normal. And I said, what do you mean? And he says, well, I was talking with some of my friends at school. And I was talking, we were, we were just talking, and all of a sudden something came up. And I said, well, you know how you have your monthly family meetings with your family? And how your dad gives you all the lists with bullet points of all the expectations and all that stuff. And they're all, so they all looked at me like, What? And he said, Dad, our family's weird. <laughs> he, said, he said, everybody doesn't do that. But he, but he thought that was just a normal family. Why? Because he watched it his whole life. And he thought it was, cause I, why? Because I watched it my whole life. And can I tell you a proud dad moment? Some years ago, two of our sons were living together in an apartment here in Monterey. And they had invited us to come over and see their apartment. They just moved in, got settled in. And I walked into their kitchen I'm going to tear up here. I, I, I walked into their kitchen, and on the refrigerator was a sheet typed out of all the apartment rules and whose chores were what and all the expectations that they had made together and agreed on as, as, as brothers. What a proud dad, you know? <laughs> You're saying, oh, you abuse them too. No, that, that's just, but that's, that's, you know, here's the point. My dad didn't say, I'm going to teach you this, and I didn't tell my kids I'm going to teach you this. When we live our lives out open, we're teaching things all the time. My dad also taught me how to smoke. At nine years old, he got me smoking. Um, my dad was a three-pack-a-day chain-smoking uh, Raleigh smoker. And he bought Raleigh's by the cartons and by the cases. And in the trunk of his car was always his tennis equipment and just stacks of Raleigh's. So, he didn't, so my dad didn't sit me down and give me a cigarette, but I watched him smoke. So I had my first cigarette at nine years old. And take a wild guess what kind of cigarette I had. A Raleigh, because they were free. They were in the trunk of his car. And, but, but, for, but for, you get the point, right? For better, for worse, we're always teaching. Are we teaching truth and goodness and beauty? Or are we teaching things that we probably shouldn't be passing on to the next generation? 
That's, that's what we have to acknowledge. And so in our culture, we know that God, God calls us, if you're a follower of Jesus, to be relentlessly truthful. If you're not yet a Christian, surely it always has a lot of people here that are still kind of finding their way to Jesus, figuring out the whole God thing. And we're so glad you're here. But a lot of people here are followers of Jesus. And if you come to the cross and receive Jesus Christ, you are called to be a truth teller. But that's challenging in our world. There's a lot of things that kind of get in the way of us really speaking the truth and speaking it with clarity. Here's just some of the things that you know, kind, of, kind of our cultural new normal can get in the way of us being truth tellers. The easy road of not telling the truth has to be overcome by the passion to follow Jesus and speak the truth even when it's challenging. So here's some of the new, the new normals, meaning it's new, but it's normal. It's always been part of culture. Here's one. I can't speak the truth. It will hurt feelings and offend people. And the greatest wrong in the world is offending anybody. That's some of the thinking today. I can't speak the truth because what if it offends somebody? Now, God doesn't want us to be offensive, but God does want us to speak the truth, and we have to grapple with that. Here's another part of the new normal. A little lie is not a big thing. A little lie is not a big thing. It's just a white lie. But a lie is a lie. And if Satan is the father of lies, every time we speak a lie, we open the door of our life just a little bit to Satan. And if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, every time we speak the truth, we slam that door shut. We make decisions about how we're going to speak and use our words. Here's another part of the new normal, the lie of silence. You know, what they, know, what they don't know won't hurt them. We tell ourselves, if someone doesn't know, it's not going to hurt them. It's not a big deal. Or here's part of our culture right now. There is no truth. We can't know if there's truth. So you can't speak your truth, and you can't, you, know, you, you can't give this truth that you say is absolute because there is no truth. We can't, people believe we can't know that there's truth. Some people believe that. Or almost more dangerous than that is this mindset. Truth is purely subjective. I have my truth, and you have yours. That's really dangerous. Well, you, know, you have your truth. That's, oh, that's your truth. Good, that's, that's fine for you. Oh, that, that's my truth, that's, especially when it comes to faith. It's all subjective, personal truth. But here's the dilemma. If, if, if I, as a follower of Jesus, say this, there is a God who made us and loves us and entered human history to save us. There is a real, true God. And another person says, I'm an atheist. I don't believe there's any God. Some people will say, well, they each have their own truth. That's how a lot of people, and, and you might have bought into that in our culture. Well, we all have our own truth. That's your truth. That's my truth. But here's, let me ask you a question. If I'm right, if a Christian is right that there is a God who loves us and made us and entered history to save us, if it's true that there is a God, and this person says, I'm an atheist, I believe there's no God, can both of those be true at the same time? And people are cautious. Well, I don't know if I can answer that. Here's the answer. No, it cannot be true that there is a God and there is no God. Those are mutually exclusive ideas, which means if there truly is a God, then atheists are wrong. If there truly isn't a God, then Christians are wrong. But they can't both be equally true. And, and so do we have, well, we just you make up your own truth. And that, that, there isn't your own truth, there is truth. And God establishes what that is. And so God calls us to this vision. The call and vision of God is this, that you would be relentlessly truthful. If you're a follower of Jesus, you would be a truth teller. You would know the truth, it would set you free, you would walk in that truth, and you would speak that truth with kindness and with grace and with kind of a natural, organic you know, thoughtfulness, but you would speak the truth. So we're going to look at four different ways that we can walk in being relentlessly truthful from 2 Timothy chapter 2. So if you have your app open or if you have your Bible open to 2 Timothy 2, we'll walk through this together. Here's the first thing, right? The, Paul says to Timothy, Pass on the truth from generation to generation in your family, in church family, in the world. Paul says we should be about passing on the truth from generation to generation to generation to the next person and the next person. I have four volunteers coming up here to join me to, to stand up here because I want to give you a picture of this. So my volunteers, if you'll come up here and just take this, your spot on these, these, uh, these four dots here, that'd be great. Thank you so much for helping out. And... Um, I've asked them to share a five-minute testimony each. I'm just kidding. Relax. They're just going to come stand up here. I just thought, yeah, you're going to run away, aren't you? Thank you so much. <laughs> they were told they wouldn't have to say anything. No, <laughs> and they don't. Okay, so look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. 
And this is, this is kind of the undergirding passage that I want us to walk away from today, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at more, but I want us to walk away from here with this in our hearts. So Paul writes to Timothy, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So here's what Paul is saying, okay? So 2 Timothy 2.2, 2. and I want you to get this picture in your heart and your mind because you're part of this picture. Someone passed on the truth to you and you're called to pass on the truth to someone else if you're a Christian. This is part of your calling. So here's what Paul says, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Paul says, and the things you have heard me say. So Paul says, there's truth. I, this, the Bible here is a picture of this. He says, there's truth that, God, that he had experienced from God's truth revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he read in the Old Testament. But Paul says, there's this, this body of truth I have. So you're Paul right now, okay? You're Timothy. All right, so here we go. So, and the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. So Paul says, you've heard me say these things. You heard me teach. So Paul says, I've received this truth. I've passed it on to Timothy. He says, the things you've heard me say. So Timothy has this truth. And he's talking about like, like, like this, this, this body of truth that we can hold to, that we can believe in, right? The things, Paul says, the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, you've heard it. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to entrust it, take this truth and entrust it to reliable people, third generation, right? But don't just entrust it to reliable people. What does the passage say? Who will also be qualified to teach others. Here's, here's the picture. Paul says, I've received truth from God. I hold to that truth. I live by that truth. So Paul says, I've received that. Timothy, I've passed that on to you. But now you pass that on to reliable people who will be able to, in turn, teach others the truth. And then, of course, the idea is that it ends right there, right? No. I mean, the whole point is that you then, in turn, pass that on you know, to, to children, to friends, to people in the church. I, I love that our high school and middle school kids this summer spent a week of their vacation taking the truth and passing it down to the littler kids in our church. They were doing this. And can I tell you something? If our high school and middle school kids can do it, so can you. We're called to, amen? I mean, we're called to, right? And so that's the picture. And someone passed on the truth to you. Who are you gonna pass on? So can we thank all these folks for standing here so wonderfully? Thank you. <laughs> but but I, hope, I hope that that picture captures you. So here's a couple of questions to reflect on. Who passed on the truth of Jesus to you? Who was your Paul to whom you became a Timothy? Who took the truth? Was it a parent, a grandparent, a Sunday school teacher, a preacher, a neighbor, a friend? Uh, I don't know who it was, but somebody, for me, it was a 19-year-old college guy who'd been a Christian only two years. I told you about him last week. If Doug, if, if Doug Drainville could do that at two years being a Christian, I thought, I can do this too. And we spend our lives passing on to the next generation. And then to whom are you passing on the truth or who could this be? Who are you taking the truth of God that you've received, that you have in your heart and your life? Who are you passing it on to? And if you say, you know, there's really not anybody right now I'm doing that with, then now it's time to say, God, who is that person? In my family, in the church, maybe I can volunteer with the youth and be part of that. I'm not sure, but, but God, I want to be passing your truth to a next generation. Sometimes the generation is family generational. Sometimes it's just the next generation of Christians. But this is God's call on all of us. And Paul is saying, don't just be one who receives the truth, but be one who passes the truth on to others. And here's a big truth that I think we have to grapple with. Truth is this. Christianity is always one generation from extinction. And Satan loves this. Now, obviously, the kingdom of God goes on and on forever. But in this world, if this generation does not pass our faith to the next generation... There is no next generation of Christians. Every generation, this generation, we must pass on the truth of Jesus to the next generation. And I love that Tyler asked you all, or, or shared, thanked you all for your giving at Shoreline. What we can do with middle school and high school and college ministry and the staff team we have is powerful because your offerings make that happen. You're part of that, but that's not enough just to give some money. You've got to give away what you've learned and share the truth with others. The call and the vision of God is that we would be relentlessly truthful. Here's the second thing we find in 2 Timothy chapter 2. The ultimate truth is a person, Jesus. At the end of the day, to know truth, to be transformed by truth, and to pass truth on is to know Jesus. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. So Paul, as he's speaking to Timothy, look with me at 2 Timothy 2 and verse 11. And Paul gives this trustworthy saying that's really painting a picture of Jesus. 
He says, here's a trustworthy saying. Paul says, Timothy, here's a, you can trust this. It's true. And he talks about Jesus. If we died with him, we will also live with him. Paul says, if we've given our life to Jesus, surrender to Jesus, give our whole life to Jesus, it's, it's, it's coming to the cross and laying our lives down. If we've died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, if we hang in there, we will also reign with him. That's the hope of heaven. If we disown him, if we reject and reject and reject Jesus and have nothing to do with him, it says he will also disown us. We don't want to hear that, but that's what the Bible teaches. And then verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. There's four truths in this little passage. And here's those four truths. First, to surrender to Jesus is eternal life now and forever. To come and surrender your life to Jesus is to lay your life down and we come to the cross and we receive Jesus, then we then have life now and forevermore. Here's the second declaration of truth. Following Jesus is not always easy. We must endure. It's not always easy to follow Jesus. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter from jail, and he's there because he followed Jesus. It's not always easy. That's the truth. We have to hear that. Here's a third declaration of truth from this passage. Rejection of Jesus has consequences. If somebody rejects Jesus and rejects Jesus and rejects Jesus, I mean, he gave his life. He left the glory of heaven. He offers, the, the Bible says God desires that none would perish, but all would come to a knowledge of salvation. But if someone has offered Jesus and they reject, 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 then they don't have Jesus and they will not be in heaven. And nobody wants to say that and nobody wants to hear that. And a lot of preachers won't even say that out loud from the pulpit anymore. But it's what the Bible teaches. We shouldn't delight in that. But we should understand the truth of it. And here's why. Here's why everyone won't be in heaven. Because the one way to have our sin washed away is through the death of Jesus on the cross. And if we reject Jesus and reject Jesus and reject Jesus, we keep our sin on ourselves. And if you invite everyone to heaven with their sins, you know what you call heaven? Hell. Hell. Heaven will be sinless because all the who are there had their sins washed away by Jesus. So Jesus says, if you reject me and reject me, then, then you will be rejected. That's heavy, that's hard, but that's the truth. And the church has always believed the truth, we've always preached the truth, we'll continue to do that even when it's difficult. And then there's one more declaration. Even when we stumble, he is always faithful. When you put your faith in Jesus, your sins are washed away, not because you're so good, not because I'm so good, because we're not, because he's so good. So when we stumble, his grace is always enough because we're saved by grace and not by our works. We're saved by Jesus. So when, when we get faithless, when we have moments of faithlessness, he's still faithful. Why? Because he's Jesus and he's committed to be faithful to you and to me. So a question for you. Do you believe, hold to, and speak the truth of Jesus? If you personally believe the truth of Jesus, you hold to it and you hold to him and you share his truth and you live it out. It's powerful. That's world changing. Is that how you live? And here's the big truth that we have to keep in our minds. Satan is the father of lies. And one big lie in our world today and even in some churches today is universalism. Universalism is a lie. Here's universalism. Everyone will go to heaven one day. Because God is loving, he would never let anybody not be in heaven. But God is also just, and also God will not let heaven become hell. So God makes a way for everyone to come to heaven, but he doesn't force anybody. He invites people. And we choose if we want to respond to that or not. Here's the third way that Paul calls Timothy to be relentlessly truthful. He says, hold to sound biblical doctrine and fight falsehood. Paul says to Timothy, know what the word of God says and hold to it and don't compromise on it. Paul says, understand, Timothy, that there are those who don't hold to the truth and you need to hold to the truth of God's word. Look with me at 2 Timothy 2, beginning in verse 14. And as I read the passage, just in your heart and your mind, imagine Paul writing this to Timothy and the message Timothy is hearing as he pastors in this city that's very anti-God and very challenging. And Paul's saying, Timothy, here's what I want you to understand. Verse 14. Paul says, Timothy, keep reminding God's people of these things. Remind them again and again. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value. It only ruins those who listen. We are in a world of quarreling. Hear, hear what this has to say. Be careful of that. Paul says, Timothy, 
Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. You handle it correctly. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Watch your mouth. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have departed from the truth. They've left the truth. They say the resurrection has already taken place. And they destroy the faith of some. False teaching. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Paul says to Timothy, you know the truth. Hold to it. Paul says, Timothy, some people are teaching what's false. Stand against it. Know what you believe. Know why you believe it. And hold to it. As Christians, we have one book. And that's one book made up of 66 books. But this one book is God's word. We hold to this. And at Shoreline Church, this is what guides us. In our homes, in our lives, this should guide us. And here's the challenge. When my life doesn't line up with this book, am I going to try to adjust this book and change it to fit my life? Or am I going to try to change my life to fit with this book. And the way a Christian lives is we adapt our lives to fit with this book because it's God's truth and he's revealed it to us. And so here's the question. What can I do to grow my knowledge of the word of God? How do I grow in knowing this book and loving this book and following what it says? Here's the first thing. Get a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, if you have a phone, you can have a Bible because you can just download a Bible app. And if you don't know how to do that, go by the Connection Center. They'll help you download it. And that Bible app will have all kinds of tools and things there for you. But also, if you go to the Connection Center, we have uh, Bibles, regular print, large print. We have Bibles in English and Spanish. They're free. They're, they're free because you give your offerings. We make sure that anybody who ever wants a Bible will give them one. And there's also a 50-day reading plan in there that you can get started in reading the Bible. And also in our bulletin and on our website and on the app, every week is a seven-day reading plan for the next seven days so you can get ready for next Sunday's sermon. And also be in God's word every day. But get the Bible, open the Bible, read the Bible. If the Bible pushes against your life and you don't necessarily agree with what it says, ask yourself, how do I align my life with what God says instead of align the Bible with what I want to do? Because that's how we live our lives. And then I want to challenge you. Get it, you know, do personal Bible study, but come to a Bible, get in a Bible study at Shoreline. Or come to a class, we have Wednesday night classes. Or get into a small group. In the courtyard today, we have some tables just as you go down the stairs. On the right-hand side, there's, a, you know, there's tables where you can, you can learn about being in a class, a Bible study, or a small group. And in all those places, you can learn God's word in the community of God's people. It's up to you. But take that next step. Go deeper into God's word. Keep learning. Keep growing. Here's the big question. or Here's the big declaration of truth. God's word is true even when it makes me uncomfortable. I've been a pastor for over 30 years and there's times I read the Bible and it makes me uncomfortable because it challenges my motives or my thoughts or my words or sometimes it challenges my actions. And again and again and again, I have to say, Lord, your word is truth. You are the truth. I want to align my life with your word. That's the journey of a Christian. I'm a pastor and I'm still on that journey. But that's part of what we do as Christians, is even if it makes us uncomfortable, we keep following. And then the fourth thing that Paul teaches Timothy about being relentlessly truthful is this. It is time to become mature in your faith. Paul says to Timothy, you got to mature, you got to grow up. You know what a mature Christian looks like? All kinds of different people look like mature Christians. You can, you can have an 18-year-old mature Christian and a 55-year-old mature Christian, and a 93-year-old mature Christian, and you can have an 18-year-old immature Christian, and a 55-year-old immature Christian, and a 93-year-old immature Christian. Your maturity in Christ isn't based on how long it's been since you said yes to Jesus, and it isn't even based on how much you sit in church. It's your growth in the truth of Jesus, walking with him. So Paul says to Timothy, keep growing up. Look, look at what he says in verse 22. Paul says, Timothy, it's time to mature in your faith. Timothy's a pastor, and he's saying, you've got to keep maturing. He says, flee from the evil desires of youth. Timothy's a young pastor. Flee from the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. I love that. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Go after it. Seek it. Along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. 
Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Our world is filled with foolish and stupid arguments. Just have nothing to do with those because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to who? Everyone. Able to teach, not resentful. Opponents. If someone's opposed to you, listen to this. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Man, when we fight and conflict with people because they disagree with us, we drive them away. When there's gentleness and kindness, it can draw them towards Jesus. And that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Paul says, Timothy, you keep growing in the truth. Keep knowing God's truth. I was given my first Bible when I was 15 years old. I'd never held a Bible in my hands before. I didn't grow up in a Christian home, so I'd never held a Bible. I was given my own Bible when I was 15 years old. And I started reading the Bible, and I, I haven't stopped. And I've read through it a lot of times. I think of my, in my office, my own personal Bibles. I think I have nine or ten personal Bibles because I wear them out, then I get a new one, and I wear that one out, and I keep them all there so I can have re a reference point. But I, th this book is alive and fresh every time you read it. And it reveals the truth of God. So open it, study it, and keep growing in your faith. So Paul says to Timothy, listen, you know, run from your evil desires. Pursue God's will. Avoid needless arguments. Be kind to everyone. Teach others. Gently instruct in the gospel. And as you do this, you will see people set free from the power and the work of the devil. You will see people set free. And if you're a follower of Jesus, God says you should be relentlessly truthful, gently, kindly, humbly, but relentlessly truthful. And, and, and there's so many Bible passages that talk about the, the spiritual battle that we're in. I want to read a couple to you just to hear this, all right? And first Peter, I, no, let me see, I want to read from John 8, 44. Jesus is talking with the religious leaders, and he says this, he's, and he's convicting them. And this, he's speaking the truth, even though it's tough. He says to these religious leaders, you belong to your father, the devil. Imagine the religious leaders hearing Jesus tell them that. Not a good thing to say, right? Well, he said it. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, the devil, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus says the devil is a liar from the beginning. It's the air he breathes. It's what he does. There is no truth in him. Man, you got to hear that. The source of lies. Every time we speak with him, well, even little white lies, that are lies. Satan is in that in some way, and we're opening the door every time we get involved. And when we speak the truth, we close the door. And then in 1 Peter 5, we read this in verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. He says he prowls around. You can resist him, but he is out there. He is prowling around. Be careful of that. Watch out for that. And then at 1 John 4, verse 4, we're told this. You, dear children, are from God, and you have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The spirit of the living God who is in you when you're a Christian is greater than the one who's in the world, the enemy. We have a real enemy. He is powerful. He prowls around like a roaring lion, but the one who lives in us is greater than him. Amen? Amen. And we walk with the spirit of the living God in us. And then James 4, 7. I love this. It says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It goes on to say, draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Resist the devil, and he will run for the door. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. One of the best ways to resist the devil is to speak the truth, because he runs from the truth. One of the best ways to invite the devil into your life is to be a person who lies consistently, or deceives yourself. Well, that's not really a lie, because, be careful, and in this coming week, the Holy Spirit's going to, you're going to start to say something or about to say something, and the Holy Spirit's going to go, that's not wise. That's opening the door for the enemy. That's a lie. And you know it. The Holy Spirit's going to challenge you. In the next week, in the next hour, respond. Speak truth and close that door. 
Here's the final truth I want to share today. When we lie, we let the devil get a foot in the door. When we speak the truth, we slam the door shut. We are called to be relentless truth tellers and it will draw us closer to Jesus. Oh Jesus, this is our prayer today. We pray that we would become relentless, passionate, humble, gentle truth tellers. We will know your word at a deeper level. We will not only keep it to ourselves, we'll hand it to the next generation. We'll grow in the truth. We'll speak the truth. And oh Spirit of God, we dare to pray. And if you have courage right now to pray this, you pray this to God. By, you pray to the Spirit right now. Spirit of God, in the coming days and weeks, show me when I'm lying. Show me when I'm hiding behind a lie by calling it a little white lie or a half-truth. Show me and convict me. And oh God, make me a truth teller so I can open the door to your Spirit and slam the door on the enemy. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. And everyone said... Amen. Amen.